session we will talk about latest development on law that will be delivered by associate professor Salawati Mat Basir um, bachelor of law master of law and phd and the session will be led by Dias Tama Ramadan um, bachelor of law magister of law as the moderator um, before we begin this session i would like to introduce our moderator based on his curriculum vitae, please allow me to read the CV of Mr. Um, Diaz Tama. His name is Mr. Diaz Tama uh, Ramadan, and currently he is, uh, he is a lecturer at Constitu Constitutional Law Department, Faculty of Law, UNDIP. And his research areas um, constitute constitu constitutional law and government, Indonesian state law, Indonesian lawmaking process, Indonesian re regional and autonomy law, and theory of the state. And his educational qualification are as follows. He attained his bachelor degree in faculty of law, Universitas 11 Maret, Indonesia, and master degree, which master of human rights, uh, in Cardiff University School of Law and Politics, Cardiff, UK. So without any further ado, I would like to kindly invite Mr. Diaz Tama Ramadan, you may take the floor. Thank you, Hanif. Thank you for a wonderful beginning from Hanif. And uh, good afternoon, uh, participants. I would like to introduce yeah firstly introduce our uh, speaker her name is dr salawati mat basir associate professor and she was graduated uh, all of her education from bachelor degree master degree and phd degree at um, university kebangsaan malaysia and uh, dr salawati specialization is international law international development law migration and refugee law and also uh, space law and she has a lot of interest in Asian law okay without any further ado associate professor dr. Salawati Mat Basir time is yours. okay thank you very much mr. thank you very much mr. Diastama um, I think that uh, first of all, I would like to apologize because I came a little bit late. Uh, I supposed to have a two, I mean, a one o'clock with all of you, but uh, I have to delay it almost 20, almost half an hour even uh, because I, I was appear in Malaysian TV to give a comment about uh, the trans crime, the trans, the the trans, the criminal transnational crime that happened yesterday with, uh, at our border with Thailand. So. Uh, they need a life, so I just finished with them, and I now I come to you. Um, I just get the the uh, the topic that I need to talk uh, today regarding uh, the latest uh, development in international development law. Okay, um, when you're talking about the development, uh, definitely this COVID nineteen is the very major problem and uh, also a challenges for the development. When you're talking about development, and I, as I said that, we're not talking about the how far that we can build the highest building in the country. We are talking about how can we protect our people from the harm of the pandemic that affected their life very much. So in the development law, we have, I think, um, I attended almost, almost more than 15 webinar for past three months just to discuss about what is actually the most challenges issue in the development. Because when this COVID come, unpredictable, something that no one can imagine, and the, the consequences, as you can see, so many people suffer, losing the job, die, and our frontliner are really uh, fighting for all those people who are sick and all that. And the government have to spend lots of money on swab tests, on the um, uh, healthcare, and also to give more money for the frontliner, to, 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 uh, for, especially for the, for the allowances and also uh, for them to protect themselves. The problem that the very much that we always talk during this pandemic that affected very much uh, our development first is the right to get a proper job. This time, 
so many people losing their job. And we are so worried to, lose, to see this phenomena in, even in Malaysia. Uh, overall, not only people losing their job, or soon, we are also facing the people who cannot do their business anymore. The very much infected, uh, the, the very much affected by this is the tourism industries, uh, do not to mention about aviation, it is already gone, uh, also retail. Now the retailers in Malaysia facing a very, very uh, deep income that is de very declined because not, not many people, not many people go to the malls, especially when people look at a certain state, then the cases is crazy. The red area are so many. So people really don't want to go. Plus also people want to save more. So we don't want to buy unnecessary thing at this moment. We want to save money. And people are talking about we need cash. We need cash or if we have a debt, we need to settle the debt. So then we were not, you know, facing a problems in our lives, especially go for bankruptcy or whatsoever. So this is the first thing. The, the, the quality of life of a people now is like normal before. So in the development, we are talking about the development is about the give more choices for people to give people uh, more, um, I can say, not only choice, but also people can have uh, can 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 have many many things to offer, and also we can have uh, many things to to select. But the problem now is so many businesses not going uh, what is being expected, and many people getting bankrupt. Big companies have to restructure their company so people have to be retrenched and have you know have to leave their job whether they give a little bit of compensation or not still this is something that really much affected soon how because when people don't have money they don't go for shopping when they don't go for shopping or spend their money then how the business want to develop to grow with the ports, a certain parts of a country are still sealed and closed you know the import and export are very much affected like uh if you can read the wto latest report uh by end of the year saying that from may to november 2020 uh wto see the very fall decline numbers in port and export especially to the developing country so that's mean the developing country are really concerned about how to spend their money so this is this is not good because previously we are like spoil of choice. We have many things that have been selling and we can choose. Now we are very careful because we don't want to choose or to buy something that we not we not really necessary for us. That's one. Second, the right to education. That's a very challenging. Very challenging because now everything done online. Like what we're doing now. We are online now. And uh, we have to, uh, I, what I can say is, uh, it's better that if you can see, um, uh, see uh, face face to face, but unfortunately we can't do that now. So I'm in Malaysia, and start some of my students are listening now in Malaysia, and some is in Semarang or around Indonesia. So you can see that uh, good, but how far that everybody can follow us live? Because many schools, many university do online uh, studies. But how many of us really can get a very good connection to the internet? Very basic internet. Second, the gadgets. How many of us that really can get a good laptop, a good tab, a good uh, iPad or something like that, that, that really can, can give us to follow the lectures or the studies online? In Malaysia, we're not being surprised that only 9% of our kids manage to get a proper uh, gadget uh, to, to study online. The rest, no. Meaning, if a 9% have, what about the another 91%? Either they do not have enough gadget, like they got five siblings, so they only got three gadgets, so see how they want to do with it. Sometimes the five of them are having the same class at the same time. So you have to give the priority for those who want to sit an exam for that for this year. So the other people who not have that is a lack of it. So I say that this is the thing that the many of government of a third world country like to look carefully. Uh, Malaysia, more or less, on last budget that being tabled at the government uh, at the parliament, but not yet been passed, talking about 
uh, we want to, uh, we, we have we allocate, I think, I not remember how many million, but we have allocate for those family who cannot find or, or the parents with a certain salary who not managed to have a good gadget for their children to have study online, they can apply for that scheme. But still, for me, you not go. You cannot. You can reach all the people because what about the people who don't have the internet line at their house? Because many of these people are using the post, uh, the the prepaid one. So if they have a prepaid one, you know they they have to. If the government do not do not help regarding the internet line, then this is also not being good for them. So the development of our country will be seen very much affected in near soon because. We're not seeing now. Maybe we were thinking it's okay because we don't want to die because of this pandemic. So let, let, let school be closed and open by January. Yes, but the quality of a teaching through online are still questionable. And second, if the children do not get a good gadget to have a class online, then how they want to understand what the teachers teach about? That's an issue. So we are still having a very basic issue to go for understanding of class online, you need to have a good gadget and you do not have this good gadget, you do not have the internet line, then how you want to study. That's why the latest UN, uh, UNICEF report uh, on Malaysian kids that they go to the area where they, this is the below 40 people's uh, families living, between uh, five kids that they ask, one would not go to school after this. And we have to understand, education is the tools for this group to upgrade their life in future. If they fail at the very earlier age to get this knowledge and recognition in their life, how come they want to get up from poverty? So that's why I say that, again, what's next for the government? Because the government is a very major agent for the development. The, the money, the allocation, the budget come from government. So if government fail to address this issue very carefully, then we will see in the next five or 10 years, the consequences for today's uh, scenario. So this is something that for me, not only we are talking about the process of a development, the rights for the education, which is a very, very important also being denied because of this COVID and also because if a government fail, to have a proper plan. Third, the very major issue is also about can we achieve sustainable development? Can we have that? Because we have about only about 10 years to achieve a sustainable development and this COVID, uh, not sure when the, all this problem regarding this COVID-19 will be settled. The aviation industry said that they're not going to fly like normal until 2024. So for this coming four years, what we're going to do with the aviation companies? What, what we can do that? So this is a thing that for me needs us to look back the challenges that the development law face. The development are actually facing the things because we look at the, the three major components in the development. First, government. Second is the, the column rights or the business uh, people. I, I'm talking about the industries and all that. Third is the civil society, which is us. So these three components is working together. If government do not have the, uh, the plan, uh, any, uh, I can say guideline, any uh, blueprint for the civil society and the businesses, how we want to develop? Where is our priority? Are we talking about at this time, we are talking about the politics, or are we talking about economics, or are we talking about the, the, the socials of our people? At this moment, majority of a country in the world, they are talking about economy. Why they are talking about economics? This is the challenges in, in, in development. When they are talking about economics, they might create the law that can give so many investment come in a very short time. That is how and why the government of Indonesia have this kind of uh, job creation law. Because for them, this is the best way to give an Indonesian people a job in a very short time. But the people feel that it might not be fair for them while they're working under that kind of law. 
because their question about the right, their question about their welfare, their question about, about the wages. So I think people have a right to do that. But for the government, they want to get rid of out easy from this kind of COVID. Because for them, yes, we have to live with it. But at the same time, we cannot just simply give a reason because of COVID, we cannot be developed. So many of our countries, they try to. So this is the situation where the challenges of it is we come up with the investment. Is there businesses that can couple with human rights? I think I, I, I already mentioned about this in a few of the lecture because I said, yes, we do have many uh, investment but still the poverty are still have rampant in that country or in that kind of society because the investors believe if I go to the country where there's so many people, I can easily get the workers and I still can pay them lower wages because if they don't want to work, I can find someone else. So this is the challenges for the development because we want to have uh, an upgrade life for all the people because development means security. Security that given to any human being in this particular country, so then the country must give that develop, development to the people. That's why we elect the government, because we want them to develop the country that give all the benefit to the people, not to the politician. But what happened now is to the politician, later to the people. So this, this is, this is the, the, the development in the, the, uh, in the development law, the challenges, the issue that people the whole world talking this i'm talking about the perception or from this from the perspective of the citizen not yet touched on the perspective of migrant immigrants workers uh, refugees that going to be even worse so in this kind of context the letters that we talk in many of the webinars around the world by the scholars in development they are talking about the planning the plan of the government next after COVID, post-COVID, during COVID. Second, is it okay by giving money to all those uh, poor group or uh, people on certain wages, just giving them money? Is, is it the money can be last for so long? And so what's next? That's why for me, it's a very important, many of us scholars suggest to the government to sit down with the researcher, with all those international agency, NGO, and you have to look the reality of a people, you know, not, not look at what, what the ministry people just do, but all over, you sit down and listen to every aspect and every people or corner of life, then you will see, okay, actually, the, maybe the plan that the government think that can work, actually it's not work, because you have to go to all this group, not only certain group. So if you can give to all, then we can have the guideline, the policy paper that can become a guideline to any of or any ministry to start work on it. That's why I'm looking for the ministry, all ministry in my country. What's your step? What's next? Ministry of Human Resource, what's next? Ministry of Women you know, uh, and Family Development, where, where are you? What, what are you doing? How many women being retrained? How many single mother? How many women who are you know affected by their business? How many of our children and women being abused during this uh, RMO? So this is have need to be put because this is these are challenges in the development. But many countries fail to address this. They are talking about how we can strengthen our political ties during this with any country or or how to you know become more aggressive towards our own people. So this is the issue that you know be, being discussed at the level, uh, even last last night, uh, a very dis a good discussion by uh, the scholars uh, from a few you uh, and organ that they're talking about what I'm saying at this moment. We were looking, we are waiting for the government, a serious government that have a very a serious plan for every uh, aspect of their citizen. For the industry, what's next for you? For women and children, what's next for you? For the people who are being retrenched, for the professional who are being retrenched, you know, all where, where is it? Even in Malaysia, I don't see that. I don't see it clearly. I'm listening, people who are asking and barking about their EPF money that to be taken out, you know, from their account. You know, and many people say, give, give us the money. You know, we, we know it's for our, our retirement, but but now we need the money. 
I'm not going to comment on that, but I, I, I want to see that what's next for the government to, to listen to this kind of people. But until today, it's just like we are still talking about can we um, having the uh, the debate on the uh, budget because the budget are not yet being passed by the parliament and it's a very dangerous sign. So this is the thing that uh, will give so much impact to Malaysia in perspective of uh, from the perspective of development. Beside that, the issue of um, uh, the issue of uh, migrant workers. The migrant workers also is the one who are always being discriminated during uh, this pandemic. And they are the one that we need to help us to develop because they are the only one who want to work in the, in the 3Ds, dirty, dangerous, you know, at sight. But our own people don't want to do it. But when during this COVID pandemic come, they are the one that being neglect so much. All those uh, help by the government only stated only for the citizen of Malaysia, only for citizen for that particular country. So are they are not important? Again, we do not have the mechanism. That is the problem. What's next? Should we burden their countries? Should we burden their government? Should we burden their embassy? You know, to take, you know, to, to look after their people? I think it's not that that much because we are the one who receiving them. So, but how is it? So this is the things uh, I, for me, uh, issues of of this uh, beside the people uh, about the human, the rights for them to develop, the rights for the education, and also uh, to get the security because the people not only want the security in terms of not being robbed or not being raped and not being harassed during this kind of situation, but we're also talking about what is the human security for us how we can get a money how we can get a money for for this uh you know to get more saving during this time and what the bank can help so much i can say that after the moratorium uh last on last uh, september many of the bank uh, actually gift uh more uh, I can say uh, cooperation with the people who are being affected, uh, how they want to plan to pay their debt. So at least I can see many banks are open mind and then try to, you know, try to feel that uh, we need to help you and we, but at the same time, we want you to pay to us, but accordingly that you can pay. So that's, that's the issue. And uh, regarding the refugees issue also, that is a, is a more challenges in development because they are the one that really, really live in limbo before COVID and now after COVID even worse. So people are with the stigma or with the with the perception, with the stigma towards the this uh, immigration and also with the uh, refugees. We can see say that uh, refugees also facing a very difficult time at this moment. So. I think when they got like Malaysia, we are not a party for that uh, convention. So we are really totally ignore them. The only person or the body that really helped them is only NGO. And without the NGO, no, they, 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 I think they are really, really dying because no one was going to help them. And in fact, how many of them are being uh, addressed and uh, being put at the uh, deportation center because they fall under the category of illegal immigrants? That's it. Okay. And what about? Uh, the, another issue is also about the democracy. How far that the country can be democracy during this particular time? Because during COVID, there are still many countries that oppress their own people. If you can see that uh, uh, Ethiopia uh, and another country also, uh, in many countries in Africa, they're having an election. You know, despite the, 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 the this uh, pandemic, they could, couldn't be bothered for them. The more important is, is the power to maintain in power. So we are questioned about how far actually this country thinking and respect the voice of democracy by their own people. Because many of this uh, country back in Africa is actually they being they are getting strong because they have a coups and also because of military beside the president. So. This is the thing that uh, in, uh, in our uh, discussion in the latest issues and challenges in international development, this is the issue. So last but not least, I can say that we are questioned also the ability of each country in the world 
to materialize the uh, uh, this um, sustainable development SDG uh, 2030. Uh, this is also being discussed at the World Bank and also IMF that can the country will be very much affected by this COVID-19, especially the poor country and also the middle country. Uh, can they facing these things? Can they, uh, you know, move on without having more money? Because IMF, IMF, for past three months, are releasing so much money to the poor country in Latin America, in Africa, and also in Asia. Because many countries, they cannot, they don't have a reserve or the reserve are very small. So whether they like it or not, they have to take their reserve at IMF. So getting more less for this country to have a reserve at the World Bank. But they can't, they don't have a choice. So the best is to go to IMF and take the money. And you know IMF, they have the structural adjustment and they also have the, the condition that you have to follow. So I can say that uh, it's really not good for the country to have for money from IMF, but they don't have a choice. They have to have money because they need to pay the salary. They need to still build the school, the hospital, despite, you know, they are still lacking so many things. So for me, this is a few uh, challenges yeah, that we uh, that we discuss and I, as, as myself, see uh, a very uh, active um, being discussed at the international level because it's really affect all population in any countries. Uh, and I think we cover, you know, we cover the situation which is in the uh, politics, in the economics, and also the social. So uh, the social also another one that before I forgot is uh, people talking about the right to health. Because during this time, people are the government giving a priority to the COVID-19 patient. But what about the cancer patient, the other patients? Are they are not also important? So people are questioning that. Like, for example, in Malaysia, many hospitals tend to be the only COVID patient hospital. So they have to let to take the other patient to another hospital. So I think this is also the scenario that make people question the government action that is it only the COVID patient that you give a priority? What about us? What about the people who are dying for the uh, cancer and others? So I think that's why in Malaysia, the government are trying their best to, to if they have the certain hospital for the COVID-19, they will ensure that the other patient for another illness also being treated at another hospital equally. Because if not, then people will be very angry. Because during this time, people really want to get rid from this pandemic. So people giving a priority only for this COVID-19 people. But also, even so, so many countries also in the world, uh, especially uh, the country who are poor, even COVID patients also, they don't, couldn't be bothered because they don't have money. To have the PPE also is a cost for the frontliner, doctors, nurse, assistants, uh, doctors, and all that. That's also, even in Malaysia, we always ask the the public to donate, to give some money, to 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 give us the PPE for our frontliners because the, the this PPE just only can use once and cannot use so many times, and and that is also still money. And during the the COVID, I think uh, but March or April uh, this year, our own nurse after their shift, they are the one who's suing all those PPE. Something that they will not be paid by the government, but they do it because they know their friends, their doctors are all in danger. So they need to have an equipped PPE. And that's why, you know, uh, like UKM, we have the hospital. So the hospital launch a fund to all those uh, UKM lecturers, students, whoever want to donate for them, they can have the PPE. Because our hospital also is one of the hospitals that handled the, the COVID-19 um, patient and also the swab test we got about hundred thousand uh you know specimen that need to uh be put in our lab so then we can send to our ministry of health so this is this is the challenges time for everyone so the topic when we we have a topic regarding this i think this is the way that i want it to be picture so then to, um if you have any question after this, you can always ask me anything, not only what we discussed today, anything regarding development. And remember, development covers politics, uh, socials, economic, uh, defense, anything. That's development. So the best countries in the world are not America, like many people think. No, 
the best country in the world is the country that give the happiness, give um, high salary, taking care of the people, of their people, and, and, and get all those free for education from the, the kindergarten level to the PhD level. That is what uh, the human index said. And many of the country that have been this is only Scandinavia country, like Norway, perhaps, uh, Finland, uh, Sweden, Denmark, because they, they have their own system, which is different from other Europe country. Uh, that's why it's very interesting in the development law to study all those things, because we can see the style of uh, uh, leadership and also how is the priority that being put into the politic by the leaders in each region very different so with this i thank you you uh, almost 26 of you here uh, any question i will i will answer it thank you very much thank you professor salawati for a wonderful lecture so i will open the question and answer session uh, is there any question i see a raised hand uh, from muhammad shaswan Muhammad Shaswan, if you want to ask some question. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Okay, uh, so uh, doctor, I have a question regarding about refugees. Uh, as you know that we as a, con as a developed country and also uh, not so rich countries and also in ASEAN, have been urged by human rights organization to accept the refugees even though even though that we have uh, we didn't have any obligation uh, literally to accept them but they keep urging us to uh, to to accept the refugees on the cut of humanitarian uh, humanity but can i know uh, your opinion about why they didn't uh, urge like G7 countries or other rich countries to accept them because uh, the, this country also has uh, the capability to uh, to nurture or also to keep the refugees in their country. Thank you. This is what we call it double standard in international politics. Um, that's why that's why I said it's very important to 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 learn international development law, because uh, what can I say is, all those developed countries always urge developing countries to do like what they do. But same also when they have a problem with other country, they also urge us to have a problem with that particular country, despite we don't have anything to do. This is the world politics. For them, okay. If the, country, if the people go to, to your countries in the, in, the, in the situation where they're in their name and you have to help because we are human beings. This is what the human rights say. Yeah, uh, true. I think Malaysia, I mean, Malaysia away on that. We, we, we're receiving, we're receiving almost 200,000 uh, refugees now. But that's not our obligation to ensure that we give them like what we give to the, our nationals, our, our citizens. They can't be that way. So, when, when so many NGOs are helping them, government are not stop the NGO to help. Government give the reason, I mean, we never freeze the account of the NGOs. We always like, okay, you do whatever you can do because government will not do it. You know, ensure that they're not involved in vice activities. Yes, that's how the government deal with this. But of course, for the first world country, actually they want us to accept these refugees and the refugees can be there for us forever. Because they themselves don't want also to, to resettle these people. As I said to you before, I can't remember which, which lecture that I gave, but there is one I tell, I, I told the student that very easy, if you can see that in Malaysia, uh, US or Australia or Canada, they are very particular to see which refugees that they can accept to be resettled in their country. They must be professional, can speak English, can speak uh, another language, French language will be additional, better, can speak Mandarin or something like that. You can see that. And most of them want the non-Muslim without prejudice. They want the non-Muslim to be resettled in their country because for them, the non-Muslims are more easy to assimilate uh, because of the religion, because of the lifestyle compared to Muslim. You know, this one cannot, this one cannot. So this is the thing. 
That's why for them, they want us to take the burden. But at the same time, they propaganda us. We say, okay, this is human rights. And you have to look on it. You have to give them right. If you don't give, you are bad. But ask themselves back, how many people that they want to recycle in their countries? They also have a very strict, look at Australia. Australia don't want to receive the refugees. Even worse than us, put in the Manus and also uh, Nauru Island. So don't blame us. We are still having them. We don't put them in any area. We let them be in our society. But I think whatever we want to do with them is, is in our jurisdiction, in our sovereignty. So let us deal with these people and you can you can't tell us what to do, but you can maybe give an opinion what is the best. But if so, you also must take these people to resettle in your country. Just don't ask us to do it. You also have to work together. But again, I just want to remind you that this is the world politics today. So if I say world politics today, it's more or less the same like with the domestic politics also. More or less. The only thing is that the world level. Okay, okay, Shazwan. Uh, yes, and also I have a question about how uh, in the declaration of human rights uh, and also the refugees uh, about the refugees convention, uh, we also, uh, even we didn't ratify the convention, but in, the, uh, in this convention, they said about we cannot send the refugees back to their country. So, uh, in order, uh, in the state of our condition right now, that we have we have accepting uh, much refugees today. So in the condition that we cannot send them back. So how that? Uh, what is your opinion about how we can manage to uh, give them about the uh, give them the basic need and also at the same time we didn't uh, let our our country get down because of this. Okay, of course, in in that you know, the UNHCR uh, in 1951 convention say that non refoulement which is we cannot turn them back. Okay, I think that so far we don't turn them back except for during COVID. Last March we can't have them, so we give them foods and water and we let them go to the international territorial water because of a COVID. Uh, and people condemn us, and not critic, people condemn us very much about it without looking at our condition in our country. So uh, I don't want to blame that because I think every every government have a right to do about it because we are not the party for that. So if, if we don't want to take them also, there is no one can blame us. But we still do take them. And that's why they have about 200,000 of them in Malaysia. The, the point is I want to say that as long as we are not the party for that, anyone can say anything to us. And we can still have our own mechanism to handle. For me, this that the way. Because we are not obliged to give anything to them even. Good enough, we give them a life, which is they can still breathe in our country rather than in Myanmar. But the, at the end of the day, of course, everyone force us, you know, force us to accept them and try to be assimilated with us. That is a long way to go. Because these people don't want to assimilate. You ask the many of the refugees, they are in their own way, except for the, the uh, very small refugee groups. And the very small refugee group, okay, because they try to assimilate like Sudanese, uh, Pakistanis, you know, they, they try to adapt. But for the big like Rohingya, they are in their own, with their own people, with their own NGOs. And they have a certain NGOs that are helping them very much. So at the end of the day, we, of course, not going to reform them back, but we have to protect our own countries from any harm. And COVID is part of the harm. Yeah. And again, I want to remind you again, these people that come to Malaysia, they already have a contact in Malaysia. They not just can simply come. They already have their uncle, their aunties, their niece, their father in Malaysia. That's why they still want to be here in Malaysia. They don't want to belong in another country because they have a contact. And again, the smuggling of them is also done by the Rohingya who already established in Malaysia. So don't, don't be so surprised about this. 
you know if you go deeper then you will understand the situation of course i'm i'm not against anyone i think as long as they are human being we have to protect and try to give as ever we can there's also the this very sad situation especially when the disability or refugee with disability and as a children uh, refugee with disability they are really don't get anything from our government uh, one of my phd students are writing um she were right she was writing on uh the the children disability the refugee children with disability she said that you know none of them like a cancer if they got the leukemia they have uh, uh too much water on their head uh the government really charged them about six thousand seven thousand you know they are refugees they don't get money so the kids is just laying down at house and one of the interview that she did the family said that we pray to god to take his life because we don't have money and he suffer so i think that is a human tragedy that's a human tragedy because i think however it is in the name of human being maybe our government have to look into the perspective of it when it's especially the disability people they don't want to be born like that but they are born here and i think maybe we can charge them but not that too much because of the situation that's why i said again it's a very important for all the government who do not become the party to 1951 convention to have a mechanism and guidelines whether you want to accept them or not if yes how if not how that's it okay so thank you for the answer professor and then next question comes from uh, aisha good afternoon uh, professor i want to ask question people are forced to wear masks in order to stay away from the viruses therefore government must take serious action for public health issue likewise and environmental health is also important as aspect during pandemic but somehow uh, face masks are not disposed into correct disposal, for example, in Hong Kong, uh, we're covered with face mask waste. So I would like to know your perspective regarding uh, this issue and what action that government supposed to do. Again, this is a more or less about the issue of the attitude of the civilians. I mean, this the, the, these people at large of course during this pandemic we are we are, yeah we are forced people like in malaysia if you don't wear the mask you can compound on one thousand ringgit get malaysia on spot and uh, don't give a reason that you don't know you have to know you know everyone knows about it okay fine but the point is the attitude of the people for me we have to dispose your uh because this is this of some sort like you know, if you use if you use the chemical uh, or the wear mask that you can wear only once then you have to dispose it in in a nice plastic bag you have to you know close it and then you can mix with others rubbish but you cannot just simply throw it everywhere in malaysia you know i can tell you what happened in my residential area that um there is an, one house that being occupied by this foreigner and this foreigner not really care about their hygiene. You know, luckily they are not uh, same row with my house. So we have the WhatsApp group of our residential area got very angry that day because the Malaysian neighbors very angry with these uh, Bangladeshis and Vietnamese foreign workers who stay beside his house. They after they are coming back from the factory, they just throw out their masks, and that dirty mask come out to uh, you know come into the the compartment of of the the my, my Malaysians. Um, uh, labor. So he got very angry and he said that this is a civic minded, he said. Do not want to 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 be racist, he said. Not want to, to look down to anyone because we are human beings. But the attitudes again, because all of Malaysia we are still here, we don't have any problem. We, we really, you know, throw it nicely. Some using the, the washable mask. So some people they love washable masks. Are so easy. No, no, no rubbish at all. But I think the government must understand that this is, you know, I think that's not the government to, to address us and how to throw out your rubbish. This is more or less is, is the attitudes of the people. So if you are the one who are really, you know, do not take care of the hygiene, for you it's nothing. But for, for those certain things, yes. That's why I say that. You see that even in Hong Kong, they are very, you know, advanced. But the attitudes, labor groups, poor people, for them, it's only money to put the rice on the table. They don't care about the environment. The people who care about the environment is the people who are educated, highly educated like all of us, because we know what is the consequences for long run for the planet. But for the, for the poor people, they don't care. They want the money to eat, simple. 
That's why when you're talking about this perspective, what the government is supposed to do, government cannot do much except to tell people, please, you know, dispose your mask nicely. But if people don't want to listen to it, it's also what can we do? We can only take action if you don't wear the mask. We're throwing the mask. You don't know who's the owner of the mask before. So again, this is, a, this is attitude problems. And the attitude problems are very much connected with the, the education of someone. I do believe that, except for driving. Driving, you have a PhD also, you can drive like devil, no problem in Malaysia. So that, that's one is different. But I'm talking about the attitudes more or less regarding the mask. Normally, I think my Malaysian people or other people who are educated, even in my university, we have a foreigners as a lecturer, we don't have any problem. But in my house area, when there's a foreigners, you know, and they're not so much, then it's make other people very angry. So this is more or less for me, the attitude of the person is, is not so much with the government. Okay, thank you, Professor. And then next question uh, from Anissa. Uh, for Malaysia upcoming budget announcement, in your opinion, is there any part of the budget will affect Malaysia relationship with other countries? Well, um, uh, I think that uh, the budget that if you want to talk about the uh, the budget, uh, connection of the budget and the relationship with other country, we have to look at the how much budget that the government allocate for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, I think uh, for quite some time, um, Malaysian, for, uh, Malaysian diplomats and also ambassadors and our, our envoys abroad, uh, they work very hard. You know, only not only to take care of good good name of Malaysia, but also to to rearrange Malaysian citizens who want to come back, who married with a foreigner who want to come back during this pandemic, and this all cost. Uh, but I think under the Datuk Sri Shamuddin Tun Hussein as the ministers of foreign affairs, I think he handled this thing nicely. I don't see a uh, Malaysian budget can affect our country relationship with any other country in the world. I think it's more or less about if we give more money to our envoys abroad, uh, to our embassies abroad, then they can do work better, you know, because everything is so expensive at this moment. So that's all. Because if they can have the life nice, not, not lifestyle nice, I mean, the, the equipment, the allowances that supposed to get, I think they will perform very well. And so far also they are performed very well. So uh, this is this is the thing. Not not so much on how how uh, our budget will affect our relationship with other countries because our our relationship with other countries are more on trade, are more on negotiation, and also on on how we deal uh, on certain issues, sensitive issues with our neighbors. So that that is the thing. Thank you for the answer, Professor. And the next question. Uh, do you think that more or less the law will change the society since this COVID situation? Or we should, oh, wait a second. All law is a tool to change the society, but somehow we also realize that the attitude from the people is very hard to be changed. Can you hear my voice, uh, Professor? I just, I just listen to your, your said change, only that. Okay, okay. I, uh, I will repeat my question, okay. yeah? Do you think that more or less the law will change the society since this COVID situation um, or we should wait until the condition back to normal? Since we all know that the law is a tool to change the society, but somehow we also realize that the attitude from the people is very hard to be changed. That's the question, Professor. It is like this. Whether we like it or not, on certain issue, we have to, you know, discipline the people because human being actually the attitudes they don't want to be they don't want to be controlled they want to do whatever they want to do without control that is the nature of human being that's why we have laws that's why in every religion we have the holy book because god knows human being cannot you know be being just free like this if you're free then they're less of the responsibility and they will not be responsible not only to themselves but also for the environment for the people for everything so I believe we need 
a very uh, good laws, adequate laws to discipline people. Not much on the punishment, but to, to make them realize that uh, this is important, especially uh, I think uh, in this COVID situation, you know, you know, people love like cross the border of the state, which is the red area and the green area. You know, Malaysian people love to go outside, love to travel, love to eating outside. The attitude is like for so long, it's like that. Couple with the good economies, we have our money, we don't go at home, we eat pig here and there. Every weekend we go for beaches, we go for any, you know, highlands area, you know, like Indonesian people, they go to Bandung, they go to all those, inter the nice place. So do in Malaysia. So, suddenly you stop them from doing that because of this pandemic. We have the roadblocks, we want to see only the genuine people can cross. So this is all stress for us. But you, you, we can't just let this thing. For me, we need to ensure that our society understand life are not going to be the same again after this. That's why we say the new normal. I not feel happy to wear the mask the whole day when I was in the office, but I don't have a choice. I don't want to carry all the alcohol tissue all the time. You know, you touch the, the screen, you do it. You touch the door, you do. You have to, you know, you have to do it with your head. But you have to understand if you be infected by the COVID, you infect all the family, you infect all the people who be in contact with you. So I don't want to be like that. That's why I say it's it's hard, but no choice. You want to die or not? Simple. Sometimes I just tell them my, my my kids when they say that why we cannot go out from house. I say not because I don't want. But if you go out, you might be in contact with these things. So if you get out from that, then how is it? Then you will, sometimes it's, it's easy to talk to the kids rather than to talk to the adults. Because the adult, that's always like how to run away from the situation. That's why when the student asks me that kind of question, don't, you don't have to wait for the condition to go back normal. We don't know when it to go back normal. We just discipline our people now, whether they like it or not. And if they don't want it, then we have to punish them. They have to know that not only for them, we take care of the people at large, not only you, but because of lack of your attitude, you can danger the whole society. That is more important to be stressed. Okay, thank you, Professor, for the uh, answer. And uh, anyone, participants, is there any more question? Not yet. Okay, so if there is no question, Professor Salawati, you can give your uh, closing statement. Okay, um, all right. Th th thank you very much. Uh, uh, I, uh, first of all, that uh, since that I get this topic, it's just, just, just before I, I give this uh, talk. Me, I, I, yeah. We have one question. Yeah. Definitely, yeah. Ah. So from uh, again from Muhammad Shah's one, mm -hmm. I have another question for you, uh, Doctor. In our political situation, do you think that racial-based political party is still relevant? Ha! Huh, what's a question? <laughs> <laughs> uh, put it this way. Uh, maybe my my opinion are not maybe maybe not being liked by others. You know. I, I, I go by merits. I not go by, by, by race or by religion. I go by merits. For me, if you can, you can lead nicely, you know, honestly and very progressive and, and, and equip yourself with the knowledge as a leader, I don't have any problem. Because I don't believe in the people who are portray themselves as so much religious and all that can do the job. They can be the worst person for me. So, in Malaysia, we are already, since independent, having the political party that based on race. So if you want to change the situation, for the old people, they can't do that. For them, no, we want to be with even Malay, Malay, Indian, Indian, Chinese, Chinese. But the young generation, I can see that they don't care. They are more open. They are more like what I feel. They want to feel that it's not about your race. It's not about your religion. It's about can you be... A leader, can you be fair to all of us? Can you respect the constitution? Uh, that is the young generation normally asked. So you can see that many of the political parties, despite before this uh, being majority on certain race, the other race also come and join. 
and many of the other race also become a representative of the MP for certain area after the election. So I do believe that if you say it's relevant or not, I'm not going to say it's relevant or not because it's already there in our in our system. So if I say not relevant, after this, there are so many people want to you know bash me and saying that since when you are become liberal, you know I don't like to be labeled liberal like that. I want people to know that people change according to the time and situation. Maybe during you know once upon a time we need this. Maybe one day this racial based political party no more relevant because it developed together with the attitudes and the mentality of the youngest because. For the level of the young people, they will die. You know, the old people, they will die. Me, 45 years old. If I can reach 95, like Mahathir, okay. If not, I die before that. So the young, like my kids, they look politics different. They look, they don't look that politics that I look. For them, what's wrong if we have these people from this race become, become a ministers? What's wrong? If we do, can do the job, it can be fair. So I listening to my student. Since back in 2015, many students, many law students are talking about we're looking for the honest and the true leader, regardless who they are. And the young generation are really, you know, accept that. So maybe, maybe, yeah, maybe the racial based political party in Malaysia maybe cannot be relevant anymore in future. Is this my statement? Maybe. Because I don't know how to predict it. Maybe people want, maybe not. But for me, people change according to the time. Our thinking change according to the modernization and also the situation. So it could be, yeah. Okay, is that clear enough? Muhammad Shaswan? Okay, another question, Professor. Good afternoon, Professor. My name is... Cheng from UKM. Yesterday, I remember you mentioned that the government used the taxpayer money to take yes, care yes. of the refugees. Can we, as the taxpayer, oppose such action by the government? Uh, okay, the government never give. Uh, the, the government never give the taxpayer money to take care of refugees. Uh, normally, I think so far my work with uh, with the Ministry of Home Affairs, we would, we uh, no allocation for the refugees. For the immigrant, yes. For the immigrants, uh, we have when they become the illegal immigrants, when or the refugees being arrested and put at the deportation center. Yes, that's how our taxpayer money being used. Same like the our prisoners, because we have to pay for their uh, foods uh, three times a day. Despite they say the foods are not good, I think uh, good enough. We still give you a food, uh, and also we normally will ask. You know, uh, their country to take care of their people. Okay, you ask me that can the taxpayer op oppose to such action by the government? We can oppose for that actually. We can oppose for that. That's why our budget is very important. The allocation budget to each ministry also is very important to see where is the money goes. For example, the money that being used to take care of the arrested refugees and illegal immigrants in our deportation centers is allocated under the Ministry of Home Affairs. Yeah. And to whom is it given? To the Immigration Department. So only the Immigration Department knows how much is it actually. So you can, you can oppose it to the Ministry of Home Affairs and saying that, I don't want you know, our taxpayers' money being used for that. That's why it's very important for the government to be more clear and to be more transparent when they table the budget. That's why people can question. I think previously, Malaysian people, they don't want to question because they don't see clear things. But since we have all those technologies and, and, and the debate has become live to our TV, we can see it. And we can debate on it. Why this kind of minister get, ministry get this, this, this budget? For example, you know, our, highly, uh, our Ministry of Higher Education, some university got low, some university get high. You know, and it depends on how the performance of the university. So once you perform very well, then you can ask for the additional budget. And you must show to this public where this money goes. That's why we have, we call it per olehan. The per olehan is from the Ministry of Finance, where all the contracts, all the money that go for the university, for the development of the country, must be recorded and must be audited. And this audit, the, the audit negara or the national audit will come and audit every 
every government body, everything, so that we know where is our money goes. So that's why we have a right. If you feel that you don't want to give to the foreigner, you have a right to tell. But you must know which ministry that the money being allocated. I uh, said that's important. So we have a right. The only thing Malaysian people they don't want to, to don't want to, to do all this kind of thing. For them, okay, like I pay, I pay, I don't want a problem, simple. Okay. Okay, wait a second. Okay, so next question, Professor. Um, good afternoon, Professor. I have one question. What's your comment on the proposed allocation for uh, JASA in our budget uh, 2021? Wow, 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 wow. JASA is, uh, is, is a backbone. It's like, it's like the, the backbenchers of a government. Uh, and and uh, this is more merely politics. Uh, these people inside is merely politics. They call it JASA. And during JASA is very happy, you know, spending money during Najib times as a prime minister. They got very much allocation. And when the government of the uh, Mahathir second time become prime ministers, he 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 withdraw all those nonsense things. So no more JASA. Suddenly in our proposal, in our uh, allocate of budget, uh, when the table suddenly we got I think about eighty one million for JASA. And everybody what what? What's going on? You know? So, uh, because we know that it's a very political thing. And I think during this sensitive time, the government should be more sensitive. Do not do anything which is nothing to do with the politics. Because if you put this, this body, which is very much to, to, to give the idea as if that, okay, whatever the government do is so the best, and, and you put in the budget, 81 million, during this sensitive time, people are angry. Even me, myself, uh, I question it. I said, in what way the JASA can get so much money and why our frontliners like police who, who you know, under the, the hot and the raining season nowadays, you know, have the this roadblock and all that. They are also open to the COVID. They are also open to all the dangers. Not even COVID. Sometimes the drunk people also will, will kill them by the trucks and all that. It's happened. So why not the money, 81 million, you give to the other education to university to internet to the uh, gadgets yeah, because many kids of poor family don't have a gadget so many people question it that's why i say if you don't want to be critiqued by your own people why having this uh, i'm the one who questioned this because for me this is not a, a, a good time to give this jasa 2021 day about jaya okay professor uh, before we move further to other question, could you please explain what is JASA for your Indonesian colleagues and international participants? <laughs> okay, JASA. Okay, JASA. This is this is this is like uh, that the Prime Minister Department during uh, Najib uh, become a Prime Minister. They are they are one of the unit there. Uh, this is the one that doing all the political things for the government to boost the image. So. Um, like, for example, your president have one unit at his uh, presidency's office where boost his image or the cabinet image. Anything to show that, wow, what you think is very good, very good, very good. You know, like, and we know that during, during Najib time, we have that. Uh, and and when, when the, the government of Barisan National no more become a uh, uh, government 2018 when... Uh, Tun Mahathir come back as a second time as Prime Minister, he said this is nonsense. So JASA all gone. So many of the people who working with JASA is a political appointment. Like for oh. example, my father is former MP. So I have been, you know, because my father was here, my father was there. So it's almost political there. Not because of their merit, because of political things. And we know they're doing the political work. So they need people like that. Suddenly out of nothing, on this plus budget, then this government, Tan Sri Muhyiddin government, give so huge allocation. If I'm not mistaken, it's 80 million to this JASA. So then suddenly people was like, is JASA not exist, man? What are they doing? What is their contribution during this COVID? So many Malaysian are angry without prejudice. I'm talking on the base of the academic uh, freedom, uh, uh, nothing to against the government, but I'm talking about the, as an expert in international development. People asking that. People like, what is this? What are they going to do? And it's make a joke in any social media. Like if something is ask Jasa, Jasa can do it for you. So people are people people are not happy with that because how come you want to have a unit to boost 
the image of the government during this COVID, which is so huge allocation to do what? If you want to boost your 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 your, your image, then do have the properly plan properly first. We don't need anyone to try to tell us that how good you are. We want to see your job, your work. So this is a thing. So this is JASA. Uh, this is how JASA uh, work at this moment. Uh, so I, I don't know how far that they established back JASA, but JASA is really unwanted situation and scenario in our politics among our people. Okay, thank you, Professor, for the explanation about JASA thing. And then next question. Uh, Professor, do you think that current situation will dramatically change the international law system? Also with the relation between one country to another? Uh, yes, yes. It, it can be affected. That's why I said that um, we have to see that if Biden become a president, and what is the next for the American foreign affairs? Because the American foreign affairs, uh, US foreign affairs will, will define different. Because uh, I do believe that uh, for example, uh, for me, uh, uh, very important that is, is it U.S. are going to grip more issue at, at, uh, in the, uh, especially in this uh, uh, Indo-Pacific issue. So if they really focus on Indo-Pacific issue, meaning South China Sea issue got them very serious. And this South China Sea issue is affecting almost three or four countries that have the contested for that area. Malaysia, Vietnam, Brunei, Philippines. Despite Indonesia are not a contestant, but Indonesia also are very important major partners because China always come across to your border ter water territory in the, uh, Natuna, not Natuna. So even though China, you, uh, Indonesia are not a party to contest the nine dash line of China, like Malaysia, Vietnam, Philippines, and Brunei, but Indonesia more or less also being affected by the presence of a China coastal coast guard, uh, coastal guard and also navy in uh, uh, in such uh, at the South China Sea. So uh, I think it can make the the, the the tension among the countries in ASEAN, or also that can give more um, hurdle for ASEAN to not to choose, but because ASEAN country we are good to both. We don't want to involve. We want to settle it nicely. We want China to respect our sovereignty. We want China to to know that uh, we want to we, we want to have a, a trade relation with you, but do not come and and encroach our sovereignty. But that's not the situation in South in in, in South China Sea. It's worse, you know. So we are not happy. But even though we're not happy, we're still dealing with it nicely, uh, accordingly. Despite a few incidents in South China Sea, especially between Philippines and Vietnam with China. That's why I say, once Biden take office, we have to see that how he deal and how he portray the U.S. foreign policy is very important because the superpower foreign policy will impact on the small on the foreign policy of middle power or small power. Malaysia can consider it just as a middle, you know, because uh, Indonesia can consider it as a big superpower because you yourself, you know, can stand on your own. Like for us, we still need a friend you know, uh, to, to, to have us, to, to be with us. So normally Malaysia will be very much diplomatic in the way of ASEAN region, because we want to ensure that ASEAN region are not being a place, you know, for any superpower to test anything. You know, I think South China Sea will be of the best issue to test all the patient and also how good all ASEAN country uh, talking about the uh, influenced by the superpower in our area. So this is the thing that if you say uh, it's going to be happen, it's going to be, and it's very much on, on to see how our uh, politics, uh, our president, our prime ministers of foreign affairs see this issue. Then they will advise accordingly to the government what to do. Okay, thank you, Professor, for the uh, answer. And then next question. Uh, do you think that the COVID-19 situation, yeah, the COVID-19 vaccine uh, trade will affect the international relation between the countries, especially between ASEAN with US and China? Um, well, uh, I think um, 
okay uh, many th there is a many theory many theory people are saying that uh well it will effect uh because it, is it is it going to be effect for me whether it's effect or not uh it's a it's really it's still not so much the thing is like this our government have a right to have uh, any any relation or to do any um uh, Test or to look on which company that they want to have for the vaccine. Um, I think um, China is actually uh, really make a statement that uh, for the vaccine in ASEAN, we will have the largest factory in Indonesia, but Malaysia will become the first country to receive it. Okay, that's how they make a statement. Uh, and for Malaysia, I think our our uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs is actually I still uh, say that we're dealing it. We we want to be fair to to all the countries that uh, you know to to look on it because we have to protect our people and we have to get also the expertise uh, to to look into it uh, to to see whether it's okay or not to test you know because it's not it's not easy because uh, the point is I want to say. It's not going to be about China or US or anyone. Singapore also develop, develop. Australia also develop. UK also develop. So the point is, I want to say is, uh, the point is that 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 will not be effect any much on that. The trade issue also is not going to affect ASEAN very much. The trade issue are more on US and China. But for us, we have more choice. We are we we live with a more choice to see that whether we. Uh, we can have more China or more US because for Malaysia, China and US are all top 10 trading partners with us. They are both important. So we don't have any problem with them. So I think uh, the vaccine trade uh, between US and China is not going to give any much implication to ASEAN because ASEAN country knows what they do. And especially, they I think they deal more on the, uh, the important thing is the benefit of the people of the country. Okay, thank you for the answer, Professor. Uh, participants, is there any more question for Professor Salawati? Okay, so, yeah. Apparently, we have uh, no question, Professor. So, you can't... Uh, give your closing statement and end the session. Okay. Um, I, I, I would like to say thank you very much, uh, even though we have a 26 participant in this, but I hope that we, we have a, something that important and this question also uh, that's uh, been asked also, I think, a very important question and we make very clear about it. Uh, I I think um, tomorrow will be the last session for me at the at this. Uh, as a visiting professors as also in the summer course. But however it is, I would like to say thank you very much for all of you because you are here and loyal uh, despite my my quite late comes here. I think uh, thank you very much uh, to all and I hope that we gain something and, and start to think uh, differently and see, put, try your best as a law student to connect with the international situation and give something to your people. That's a very important, thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you for your wonderful lecture. And so that is the end of today's session. Uh, thank you for all of the questions from participants. Um, I will give back the time for you, Hanif. Thank you, Professor. Well, OK, uh, thank you. Professor and Mr. Diaz. Uh, well, uh, for this uh, next session, we have photo session. Can you all please turn on your camera? We will start the uh, we will start taking picture after all of the participants turn on the camera.
Okay, is that all? Well, I will count. Uh, I will count until three, and please post up your uh, style on your camera. Okay, I will count. Uh, one, two, three. Okay, thank you very much uh, for your attention and your loyal participate in in this um, event and. We have finally come to end our session and it has been a great and wonderful afternoon with all of you. And I would like to say, we would like to say thank you for your attention. Thank you all for your being here and thank you uh, and have a nice day. This meeting will be ended by the host. You may leave the meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Prof. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Prof. Thank you. Bro, thank you everyone.